Are you looking for new books to read? Do you like finding a new special author? Are you tired of the same old books from the same old authors? Well then, welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where you can hear from fantastic new authors. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have worked hard to write great new books. Hear about their book and why you should check it out. So sit back and listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. All right, so uh, let's get started. So this is kind of backwards for me. Usually I talk about books and then we discuss other things, but I got so excited talking to you. I talked about all the other stuff and totally forgot about your books. So I, uh, this is actually part A when I put them out. So it'll be backwards for everybody listening, uh, but that's fine. It keeps life interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So Justin, um, we already found out a little bit about you and all that. It's coming up in the actually next part of the interview, but I wanted to talk about your books because you have some interesting titles. Um, so tell us about the fiction that you write. Sure. Uh, so I write a lot of different kinds of fiction. And um, I mean, so a lot of it is sci-fi. A lot of it is fantasy. Uh, I kind of got my start back in the day when I had been waiting for the next Game of Thrones book to come out. So I wrote my own fantasy. And then it all went crazy from there. I did some middle grade stuff that I finished before that one was really done. And uh, kind of inspired by Harry Potter and whatnot. And then went on to write more uh, supernatural stuff. I wrote with Michael Anderley for a little bit. We did probably, let me just think real quick, maybe like 16 books together. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, nowadays I'm writing a lot more of like kind of space fantasy, like Star Wars type stuff. Okay. So a c- couple questions. Um, first of all, do you find problems with going from fantasy to sci-fi with readers or people like, hey, this isn't like the last couple books? Because I hear that a lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, So what's interesting about Anderley's readership is that his is very much a mixture already. So and a lot of those readers carried over to me, uh, which is great. And so they don't really care. I would say that when you're trying to reach the broader market or when uh, I'm moving away from that focus, you know, then it's different. Uh, Like lately, I, I haven't written a book now with Michael in like two years at least. So I'd say that I probably have lost like the idea that originally there was a lot of his readers who would check out my stuff. And now it's just the ones who are truly loyal and really interested. And Michael publishes so much, you know, like a book a week or a book a day or who who knows. (laughs) It's a lot that it's not like his fans have time to go check out other authors anyway, unless it's inside that universe too much. So reaching out to new audiences, I'd say, yes, it's a lot harder to kind of try to straddle two horses at the same time. Uh, But a lot of my newer books have been, just sci-fi or especially the next three that I have ready to go are pure sci-fi. So maybe that'll make it a lot easier. But uh, when you're trying to publish only sci-fi or sorry, when you're trying to publish a mix or you're trying to go, yeah, only sci-fi and then fantasy and back and forth, uh, I do find that difficult. And a lot of people will use pen names for that, right? So that you have, because of Amazon algorithms and whatnot, so that you can not get confused, get, not get the audience confused. So how did you start writing with Michael Andale? Because he's obviously one of the rock stars in the indie world. Uh, Yeah. 20 books for 50K. Everybody seems to know him. Uh, Yeah. So how did you get into writing with him and so many books? Yeah. So I was in the early stages of 20 books kind of. And he was on there and somebody I said was somebody I was talking to was mentioned, hey, I think Michael might be open to collaborations. Why don't you reach out to him? And so, so I did. And so I'd written before that I was writing at Telltale Games at the time. I had writ- I had just left, I think, and I was writing, uh, I was writing some werewolf superhero kind of books, not superhero so much as it wasn't really urban fantasy, but supernatural thriller, I guess is a good title for that, for the genre. And I had done a series with my buddy, Michael Laron that was a, like a, we called it modern necromancy. And it's a guy, it's kind of, kind of reads like a video game in the style of action and whatnot, but it's, it's a guy who has to go try to find his lost fiance and ends up dabbling in necromancy and whatnot. Uh, and so Michael was publishing these vampire books and werewolves and stuff. And I was like, Oh, I'm doing werewolves and I'm doing this kind of stuff. Uh, would you be open to, and I told him about, of course, telltale and all that and walking dead and whatnot that I'd done there. And I said, would you be open to me writing into your universe? And, and he was like, sure. And at the same time, he was talking to Craig Martell about doing that. And so Craig and I were kind of the first ones. Oh, he had done a couple other little spinoffs with other people too. But we were the first ones to really dive into his uh, Bethany Ann 
uh, Carthurian Gambit universe and really uh, write a lot of books in there versus ones previously had only done like two or three, I think. Uh, T.S. Paul and some other guys jumped in around the same time or shortly after. And then since then, it just kind of exploded. But yeah, I, I dove in because at the time, my books were making okay money, you know, like a thousand or two a month, nothing crazy. And then uh, he was like, dude, this is going to be great. It's going to be huge. Trust me. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. So as soon he said, just get ready. As soon as book one launches, just be ready to write book two as fast as you can. And sure enough, it went. And then suddenly I went from like one to 2,000 a month to 10 to 15,000 a month. Wow. And nice. so, uh, of course, if you see that happen, you're just going to dive in head first, right? Like right. there was nothing holding me back at that point. So I just went hardcore. I kept my, I had left the video game job and taken a side editing job for a little bit. And then uh, I was like, forget this. I'm out. I'm going to write full time. So I left and I started writing full time and, uh, and just dove in and just kept going. So that's why we ended up getting those 16 books out uh, right. fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, that's kind of the 20 books to 50K motto almost, it's, you know, fast publishing, getting them out, getting as many books out as you can quickly. Um, so you, you're not doing that as much. And you mentioned the new series you're getting ready. Tell us about that new series. Yeah, yeah. Lately, I've, I've definitely calmed down on the writing. <laughs> uh, so in part because it, it's tiring, right? The anxiety and all that and trying to throw your own money behind each, publish, each book you're coming out with, each launch. And you got ads and you got book covers and you got all these things, editors to think about and relying on all these people's time. And, uh, and yeah, so so I've been actually doing a lot of ghost writing lately because of that. And that's been great. I, I charge enough to where I know that it's more than I would make on my own and that I won't feel guilty uh, with that time. So that, okay. you know, <laughs> and, and I think that's the key. I see some people out there charging like $200 to write a half a book or something. And I'm like, you're going to hate yourself. Like that's time that you could have been spent doing something amazing. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so I charge you more like 15000 a book right now, which makes me feel happy because my most recent books were making less than that. Uh, they weren't always making less than that, but I don't know, with COVID or something. So anyway, my recent books, what I've been doing is I just kind of write for fun and for passion right now. And uh, I'm working with a buddy and we've published a book or we rewrote a book together, a buddy who I kind of got me into writing in the first place. And that one's, that one's a lot of fun. We're just sending it out to beta readers right now. I think we're going to publish late. November, mid to late November. And it's about a guy who gets taken up on a safari uh, to a kaiju planet, basically a planet with huge, humongous monsters uh, for safari. Right. But then when he gets there, he finds out that he's actually being used as bait to lure out this other group that's up there. And so there's all these fun, you know, back and forth and intricacies and big, humongous kaiju style monsters and whatnot. So that's great. And there's no fantasy on that. It's just pure sci-fi, uh, which is, you know, fun, like I said. And then we did another one together that's uh, more like, uh, there's a lot of Netflix shows that are kind of like this, like event. What is it? Uh, my brain always blinks on names. Evangelion, whatever you know that one. The the, the mechs and whatnot. Um, oh, um, I should pull these up before I talk. Yeah, about yeah, <laughs> I, I'm drawing a blank too, but we can yeah. look it up. Yeah, that stuff. So, so it's like that kind of story with mechs and whatnot. And then, and then I we did a, one with a buddy who lives here where I live, who I met through connections, who works at Disney. He's actually doing some really cool stuff now. He's co-writing and co-directing their next short. So hopefully that'll go big places for him. And we did a fun one that's kind of like, we call we like to call it Robocop meets Ninja Turtles. Um, <laughs> so it's a lot of robots and bounty hunters and kind of craziness uh, nice. over the top insanity. But very sci-fi in the sense that it's more on the Robocop side. It's it's uh, There's no fireballs coming out of your hands or anything crazy. <laughs> like no, that. that would be cool, though. I mean, you know, you could yeah. get flamethrowers. <laughs> Yeah, so you could do that if it was a science-based <laughs> fireball. That's true. And right. We do have some fun weapons that are used, of course. But yeah, so I, I've been leaning a lot more into this. I actually got uh, somebody somebody reached out to hire me for uh, ghostwriting a fantasy novel, and I started thinking about it. And the more I did, I just wasn't that into it. Um, for me, especially, like even Game of Thrones, one reason I liked it early on was that like for the first 90% of book one, there is no sign of real fantasy, right? It's all... Like nobody has magic that you know of and there's talk about white walkers and talk about dragons but you don't know if they're actually real or not and that, that's what i loved about those books and then even when the magic and stuff starts do, does start happening it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming until you know the white walkers and stuff start happening later on then it gets a little more in your face but that's what i that early stuff is what i love and so when i started looking at this concept and there's all the magic and all this stuff and i'm just like hey eh. so so i definitely am leaning more into uh, kind of the straight sci-fi, but I'm also going more thriller lately. So I've been outlining a few thriller books that are just 
you know, a guy or a girl gets into a situation and it's crazy and you're trying to survive and you have some friends that you meet along the way, some allies and some enemies. And, and I just like that, you know, it's just the same, same stuff that I've always enjoyed writing, but I'm taking out the magic and the science fiction and all the insanity and just focusing on characters and what makes characters awesome. And that, I think no matter what genre you're writing in good characters, uh, yeah. you know, what people really fall into and love. Yeah. After like uh, 50 books, you just get tired of writing another spaceship battle or another <laughs> way that somebody conjures up a spell or, or you know, coming up with a yeah. magic system. Okay, for this battle, go see book five and then book seven. Make those <laughs> yeah. two battles and just we're good. those together. You get the idea. Yeah, that's yeah. about what happened. <laughs> big ship shoots, another big ship. There's something explodes. People get sucked into space. We're and good. That's another cool thing about George R. R. Martin's books in Game of Thrones, right? Like, yes, in the TV show, we see some big battles, but a lot of times in the books, they'll just kind of be like, and there was a battle. And then you move on to the next character. And you're like, yeah, you're like, why waste time? Like another sword clashing. Yeah, there's, he doesn't really waste time on those things. He focuses on the characters. Right. The, uh, and that's what's literary in his style, I would right. say. Right. The, the first uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they made the movie, I mean, that end battle was like 15 minutes long. It's literally <laughs> yeah. one page in the book, you know, it's yeah. just <laughs> the battle in the end. So imagine yeah. Yeah, that. It. But, you know, I, I mean, I go to movies to see the explosions and the big stuff. So, you know, it's a nice balance. Um, yeah. How, how did you get into ghostwriting? Yeah, so that actually started with this buddy who I was talking about. Uh, so the way it first started was he was saying, well, I, I was talking about how COVID and whatnot had to kind of hurt the uh, the income on the book side. And he's like, well, what if I pay you money and you write my idea? you know?" And then, of course, he's reading through it and commenting and doing some little additions here and there. He's like, you write my idea, and then after I make my money back, we'll split the royalties. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. And that's kind of like ghostwriting, but not exactly, because I'm still having my name on the cover and getting royalties from it. But then I started thinking, well, what if I charge double or triple whatever he's paying me and and actually do some real ghostwriting? So I just put it out there. I was like, if nobody hires me, I don't care because I'm still doing my own thing and having my fun. And I have a couple of side jobs popping up and I'm supposed to start something full time maybe in the next week or two. Uh, so, so I'm like, hey, whatever. But I, I put it out there and I started getting like insane amounts of offers. And so I'm like, oh. Okay, so why don't I raise the rate a little bit? And then again and again. <laughs> and so I think that, the key is just keep raising the rate until you uh, feel like you're not getting any more offers. And then, right. then you're, you're set. <laughs> that, that's a, uh, an old musician's thing. You know, go out there and charge triple scale. And yeah. people think, uh, hey, he's really good. I want him. And you, you yeah. make it. You know, the people that go out and say, yeah, I'm just go, you know, $100. People are like, yeah, he must not be worth it. It's, it's a and weird psychology. Yeah, and I don't think it's necessarily charging more what you're worth as it is charging what you'd be willing to take for that amount of time, right? Right, yeah. Like, I don't want to just sit down and write somebody else's book per se, but if they're going to pay me this much money, then of course I'll write that book for you, and that's awesome. And if they have the money and they feel like it's worth their investment, I'm always up front. I'm like, hey, are you going to self-publish this or traditionally publish? What's your goal here? Like, If you're going to self-publish this, you're probably not going to make back what you're paying me. I hope you understand that. And they're usually like nine times out of 10, they're like, okay, I've had like one or two people be like, really? Uh, 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 and then pull out. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, like if you're an expert marketer and you know what you're doing and you have a lot of money to put behind the ads, then maybe you will. But uh, it's not likely, you know, like a lot of self-published authors will be lucky to make five to $10,000 off of a book, which is sad. A lot of them are making a lot more than that for people listening who are like, oh, really? That sucks. <laughs> There's a lot of people making great money off of self-published books, but it's just good to be realistic uh, going into it. Like if this is your first book and yes, you've paid somebody uh, who's amazing to write your book for you, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take off. So uh, keep yeah, that in mind. <laughs> very few first books seem to skyrocket uh, no matter what. I mean, and that's the whole point of the 20 books to 50 K, right? Uh, yeah. Don't worry about that first book. Wait until you get your 12th book before you start. And even when it's your 12th book, right? Like it, it might be your 13th book that just suddenly takes off. And, and that's one thing that got tiring for me doing it on my own where now I just want to kind of do it here and there whenever I feel like it is you put so many out and you, some of them hit really big and some of them don't and uh, you just don't know. So it's kind of like hitting the roulette table, right? Like what if you put out 10 in a row and they all kind of flop and that 11th one is the one that goes big and that's awesome. And that's what but, keeps uh, people going back for the gambling. Yeah, Pull that exactly. lever one more time. Right. And, and some authors have it so well down that they, they're more marketers, right. And they can right. make each of those books make at least a minimum threshold. Uh, and that's awesome for them. But, uh, I've always been more of an author in mindset versus I'm less of a business person. I just want to write my books and have fun. So that's why writing with Michael was so great because he takes care of all that. And so on this style of ghostwriting too, out of like 
probably the last six jobs that I've taken, only two are true ghostwriting. The rest of the, the other four are like, we want to use your name, of course, because it helps their brand or whatever. And and if I love the concept and I feel like we stuck to my vision of what I was writing, then of course I'm okay with it. Yeah. So uh, what type of feedback have you gotten from writers or from readers? And this, I, I don't, don't meant this to sound bad, but did you notice any difference in feedback when you were writing with Michael as opposed to on your own? Mm, I don't know. I do think that I've grown a lot as a writer. So it's been, that was when I first started writing with him, that must've been 2016. So five years ago. And, and I'm always trying to learn and grow and all that stuff and think I've done a good job at it. Um, so, so when I look at some reviews from some books that I wrote, like right after I started writing on my own with him, some of them are great, but some get very confused. They're like, is this YA? Is this not YA? Is a, you know, like I have, Shadow Core, which kind of is almost YA, but it's not really. It's just it has a teen protagonist and does deal with some teen stuff. And I don't really swear in that book because I'm not big on swearing usually. But Michael Enderley, if you guys know, his books are full of swearing. And the books I wrote with him were full of swearing. So you might have some people who got confused about that. And that showed through on some reviews too. And I did another book there. I wanted to do three protagonists, three points of view, which is you know not quite George R. R. Martin style, but in between the two. Versus my Michael books, I usually stuck to one point of view or maybe two at most. Uh, and so some readers did have that like, uh, oh, I had a hard time with the switching back and forth between the three protagonists type thing. But I, I don't think there's any big like substantial craft comments that I've received. Um, I have more recently received good feedback because I'm doing this thing where I'm like basically being a uh, asterisk ghostwriter, like not a real ghostwriter, whatever you want to call that. A writer for a hire who right. still has freedom to do it my way. But what's cool is I'll do it my way, but then like my buddy who's working with me, he'll go through and comment, hey, let's get a slowdown moment here. Or like, hey, this is awesome, but there's too much action going on. Let's get some description going. And the stuff that probably a good editor would call out for me, but they haven't been as much as they should. And But because he's, his name's going to be on the book too, and he wants to make sure he's proud of it, he's doing a really good job of calling out those things that I hope other people would do. <laughs> and so... Uh, what I should do is hire him to be an editor on all my books, probably. <laughs> but I, I have been getting better feedback in that regard because I have a lot more attention to these moments. And uh, and it's been a fun thing where I've actually been listening back to my old books, too, and kind of feeling that action fatigue at moments and, and realizing, like, oh, man, I must have been just, like, in a hurry at that point or just, like, really excited about the action. But I got to remember that a lot of readers are not as – uh, ADHD as I am, you know, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so they want those moments to slow down occasionally and get the description. And like, even as a reader, I get so bored with that stuff. I'm just like, skip the page, skip the page. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't take those people into account when I write my books, because I want more people to read it than just me. Right. And, and that's interesting because, uh, I was doing some beta reading for somebody and they said, you know, let me know where you stop uh, yeah, and yeah. put it down. Let me know where you skip and et cetera. And I said, I don't think I've ever skipped anything <laughs> in a book. I, there's yeah. only a couple books I get partway through and I'm like, I just really am not enjoying it and I'll put it down. But I'm not one of those that skips paragraphs and things. I just can't do that. <laughs> I got a funny story for you. So I was telling everybody about how my favorite book is Elantris by uh, Brandon Sanderson. And and it is a great book. And I kept I kept telling people this. And one day my buddy who has heard me tell this over and over again, he, sits with me, he looks at me and he's like, Justin, you do remember that – you only read two thirds of that book, right? <laughs> Cause it's a three point of view book and halfway through the first chapter, one of the point of views, I was so bored. I just skipped that point of view for the rest of the novel. And I was like, Oh damn. So I went back and finally read that point of view and I still love the book. And it's a great point of view once I finally gave it the, the time of day. But it's, what's funny is I didn't need to read that point of view to get the book or to understand the story at all. It just, Brandon Sanderson loves to flesh out his worlds and get more points of view and have a lot of fun stuff going on. Uh, and it did add a little bit to that character and the story, of course, the rest of it. But um, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> it, on that point of skipping, I had totally forgotten that I just skipped a whole third of the novel. <laughs> wow. And that's funny, too, because we talked about people that start video games and don't finish them, but love right, the game. Right. You know, they get 20% through and say, yeah, it's one of the best games ever. I've never finished it. You know, oh, I do a lot of that. <laughs> games, you know, nowadays they're like. Even when I was young, I guess, too. That was like the pride, right? When you're a true gamer, you love a game that takes 100 hours to beat, right? <laughs> but now we're old, and we have right. families, and we have jobs or writing to do or whatever. And like 100 hours out of my time, that's a lot of money that I just spent, you know, and the opportunity cost of what I could have been making from writing. Uh, so it's tough. So, But I love playing these games still. So a lot of times I'll get 
like Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, I got that and I played for probably like 15 hours. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is going to take forever. And I looked up how far I'd gotten and it's like barely anywhere at all. And I'm like, crap. <laughs> and so then I ended up just having to watch the rest of it on YouTube. Because I want like, the, you know, the cutscenes at least so I know what happened. Because right. I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to have time to finish playing this game. Right, yeah. I feel those people, yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I'm on the other side of that because I don't really have kids and stuff to worry about so much. So I've got more gaming time <laughs> back. But nice. I've actually been spending more of it writing and reading. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so of course, when I get gaming time, what did I just do? Get the Alan Wake remaster, which I already played all the way through, and just go do it again, and you know, ignore stuff I haven't done. <laughs> I will say that when I play games, is probably that and showering are probably the two best moments for when story ideas start hitting my head. You know, because you, you won't be related zone to out. the game. Yeah, you just zone out. You just like you're out there like crunching and like you know just leveling up and gathering some items or whatever, and then I'll say like an idea for a story. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I love that. I, I was talking to, I, I got the, uh, so where do you get your ideas at once? And yeah. I'm just like, man, where don't I get ideas? It's like, I, yeah. I, I probably got three ideas driving over here today type thing, you know? <laughs> just, yeah, look at the way these tree intertwines in the branches and I could tell a story. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's interesting though, that because I that's something I had to learn is, Oh, that's a great idea. It's a scene or a character, a setting, you know, and I write it down. And then I go back and I'm like, that's a great idea. And I started realizing, but what's the story? And th sure. There's a great idea, but you have to have the story to go with it. And uh, yeah. so that's something that I didn't do so much at first. I've got a lot of ideas still written down, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's great to write those down. I found that sometimes I'll go through and realize that two of them just need to be combined, and then that's the story. Like I'll have this and this, and I'm like, oh, now it all makes sense. Yeah, you know? I, and I actually did that with the next set I'm going to be working on. Uh, oh, I started a bit, but yeah, it, it kind of got mishmashed a little. So who knows? It'll probably never sell because no one will figure out was this steampunk or is this alternate history or what? Yeah, whatever. Well, we did that with a lot of our. Old like the stories that are out there too sometimes. So shadow core, the one that I already mentioned that for me started as a little bit of apocalypse now meets Harry Potter. <laughs> and if anybody reads the book, I'm sure they will not get that at all. I don't, you know, there's a slight hint of the apocalypse now and that her goal is she has to go out there and hunt down, you know, some rogue person who used to be on our side, but is now not really. And, um, and she learns about her skills along the way. So that's probably the extent of the Harry Potter ish. But that, but it started from me writing down, okay, Harry Potter meets Apocalypse Now, and how can I make that awesome yeah. in space? Yeah, and, and so it's a it's fun Please starting tell place. Me you had a bunch of wizards on broomstick, a whole wing flying into a <laughs> uh, right of the Valkyries. Right now, there's no wizards. That one is kind of science fantasy. It's definitely more on the sci space opera side than the. Uh, so it's a little more like Star Wars in that sense. There's definitely less fantasy. Like the main character has some weird alien ability that she can use to do something with atoms that causes explosions if she focuses hard enough, nice. but she's only half alien. I totally spoiled half of the book for you guys. If you guys didn't read it, sorry, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> don't worry. That's only the first book. There's still three after that. Nice. So uh, if you had a choice, someone uh, came with an option for your books, would you rather have them turned into movies or TV shows? Yeah, it depends on the book. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, we're actually, pitching some stuff as TV shows and movies right now overseas. Uh, and uh, one of the story ideas is very much a TV show idea and just lends itself so well to like the multiple episodes and going on for a long time. And each episode maybe focusing on different people or not necessarily, but coming back and forth like that versus some of them are definitely better as movies. So shadow core, I think would make a great TV series, you know, like more of a star Wars version of the expanse type thing uh, versus I don't know. I guess a lot of them would be good. Well, like these new ones coming out, like the one I was just talking about with the uh, the safari to the kaiju mm -hmm. planet. Definitely a movie. That's 100% a big, movie. Big effects uh, and stuff. Yeah, and it's a story that could be told in an hour and a half or two, you know, versus like I could easily see how that could be adapted without losing the, the heart of it versus Shadow Core. If you tried to make that whole series into a two-hour movie, you just you lose so much, right? right? right. So, and we have plenty of examples of movies like that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely more of a movie guy at heart. So, like, if something got made in a TV show, I'd probably be like, that's amazing. But if it gets made into a movie, and I'm going to put an asterisk next to it. But I'll finish my sentence and say, if it got turned into a movie, I'm going to feel like, success, I'm a victory, you know, victor in life. Um, 
However, on the other side of that, I feel like so many movies are made that are garbage, that are low quality, that nobody cares about, and they just fade away to you know nowhere. Versus TV shows, uh, I feel like there's not that many TV shows of this kind of you know in this genre. So if it was made into a TV show, that's almost more of a success in some ways because it's actually a, a legit thing. Versus yeah. a movie could just be like a movie that gets made and everybody's like, oh my god, that's garbage, and then nobody ever remembers that it was made. Well, so that's, I, a, that's a tough question. <laughs> well, I, I think the landscape has changed too. Uh, you know, right. you know, especially from like when I was a kid, you had big movies and you had crappy TV shows, but you don't have that so much. You have really good TV shows and maybe a good or maybe a crappy movie. So, yeah. Right. But it, you're gonna say if you got if you one of your shows or movies or books whatever was turned into either uh, the Wonder Years or the Princess Bride, you know, which one of those would you have under your belt? I'd probably choose the Princess Bride. But again, like you said, it probably depends on the story and the series. Yeah. I mean, uh, more for my my own self of fulfillment, you know, right, like right. like in life, if you looked at put those up on your wall and you're like bragging to people, like, oh, I was the creator of the Wonder Years, which I think is an amazing show, yeah. or I was the creator of Princess Bride, which is the best movie ever made. Uh, I would choose the latter. Yeah. So, so just <laughs> like, have you seen the new Wonder Years? Show? Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. Okay. Uh, it doesn't feel like the Wonder Years to me, which is why I say, yeah, it just uh, feels like somebody made a new show and then slapped the Wonder Years on it. Uh, and there's definitely, um, well, you know, time period, but you know, you think of things different when you're younger and older. Uh, well, there's a lot of good shows that are kind of already what the new one is, which it, so it, to me, it feels kind of like an episode of blackish or mixed dish or something like this, because that's what it's dealing with is similar issues. Uh, and it's in the same, like Mixed Dish was made in the 60s. I mean, it's based on the 60s or 70s, some time period like that, uh, which is the spinoff of Blackish when the mom was a little teenager in school. And, uh, and and so for me, when I'm watching these two, I'm like, I've already watched this. I've already seen these episodes, you know? And it's a different tone, of course, but it, right. it still very much feels like it's already been done. Well, I, you know, Wonder Years was definitely unique at the time. So yeah, and I think it still could be if they made it again, even with a with a black family or however they wanted to do it. I think that's a great concept. I was so looking forward to it, but it doesn't focus on that sense of nostalgia, which is what the Wonder Years is all about. You know, right, it's, right. It's, you just watch that, you just hear the song, and you see the people running on the street, and you're like nostalgia. But right, the new show right. comes out, and it's not. It doesn't feel at least episode. One, I've only watched episode one, so episode one does not feel like it's about nostalgia. It feels like it's about other stuff. Right. Well, maybe, you know, you got to give shows sometimes a chance to get their yeah. footing uh, like Orville, you know, that they started off as let's do the comedy parody of Star Trek. And after episode three or four, it turned into Star Trek in today's world and, you know, totally different field of the show. Orville is amazing. Yeah, that show is great. Like you think it's going to be some stupid comedy and then it's just like, nope, it's full of heart. It's great. It's well done. Yeah. Bam. The first couple episodes definitely were. They made fun of themselves and they were goofy and silly, yeah. but you know they definitely altered by episode. Four and it still there. is in the context of what it's doing. Like yes, but at the same time, it's not like the the guy who has an egg, you know, and that whole thing. And it was it's very silly, but at the same time, it's also very not. It's like it could happen, and it's a fun episode of a show that could have been right. in, in Star Trek in theory. That, that's how I tell people that said, "Oh, I didn't want to see it. It looks stupid." I'm like, but you got to watch it because it's become if Star Trek never existed and they created Star Trek in 2020, 2019, this is what it would be. Uh, yeah. Know, so, um, so uh, you told us about your plans and what are some, did I ask you last time what some of your favorite books were? I don't remember your favorite. Uh, books. I don't recall either, but uh, yeah, well, I already mentioned, of course, Elantris, which uh, at least two thirds of it is my main favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so I'm a big Brandon Sanderson fan and George R. R. Martin. And those guys are what got me into writing in the first place. Uh, love the Game of Thrones books. I love some of his earlier stuff too, like the vampire one, George R. R. Martin did, um, Fever Dream. And uh, of course, other Sanderson, uh, Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson, that whole series, the trilogy, I think is amazing. Uh, he has a spinoff series of it too that I never got as into for some reason, but I'm sure it's also amazing because he's just a great writer. And he does one called Skyward. Skyward, I think it is. And he also does the Reckoner series, which is like, so Skyward's a sci-fi one with a young girl. Reckoner series is young superheroes. Both amazing. So good. So I would just say anything by those authors is probably going to blow your socks off. Uh, and like I mentioned, one of those is sci-fi, but you know, uh, traditionally it was, it was fantasy that got me into all this stuff. I love the Harry Potter books. I had a funny situation where I avoided them for the most of my life. And they came out when I was in the Marines and uh, I didn't touch them. So that was like, 2000 or 2001 is when I first saw one on a shelf in Okinawa where I was stationed and I was whatever who cares kids book right 
And then I was flash forward to 2007. I was on a beach in Puerto Rico and somebody had book seven lying there. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a chance. I have nothing else to do but sit here in the sun and enjoy life. So I opened up book seven and just plowed through it. I was like, oh my God, I'm in love with this book. <laughs> and so I started Harry Potter with book seven. And then I went back and read one through seven and then eight. Uh, or was it only seven books? I forget now. My seven, brand. eight movies, seven books. Yeah. So no, I started with book six then. I started with The Half-Blood Prince. Okay. And then I read one through five and then six again and then seven. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think those are some of my favorite books. Nowadays I'm reading other stuff. Like I'm reading uh, the, uh, you know, which one? Uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, okay. And I'm loving that. I'm listening to the audiobook and the narrator does an awesome job. Um, I'm reading, uh, I just started reading some, uh, in, not Indiana Jones. Um, what's, you know what I'm talking about? The, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, James Bond, James Bond. I started reading some James Bond and I was, I'm very impressed with the writer. Like it's really well done. It's a lot more, um, tongue in cheek than I anticipated it being, uh, you know, based on the, the newer movies, of course, they're very serious. Yeah. I guess the older movies kind of feel more like the books feel when you're reading them. Right. Right. Uh, you know, you're reading the Ian Fleming one. Yeah. Because there's a um, a continuation by I think it's okay. John Gardner. Oh, oh interesting. No, I only read the old one. I always read one of them. I forget which one it is. It, was, it had to do the Japan stuff. Uh, anyway. Well, so. <laughs> uh, just speaking of uh, uh, one of the movies, I forget one of the Roger Moore ones, uh, where he's in New Orleans and there's a, uh, a funeral procession going by and they capture him and throw him in the coffin. I don't know if you remember that no. I was in New Orleans this past weekend. I stood and I took a picture of that spot. Oh, cool. Fun. Yeah, that's always fun. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. All right. So I, Justin, I appreciate you jumping back on. We, we, you know, we've been back and forth a couple of times. So taking the time, it's much appreciated to find out more about your books, catch up with you again a little bit. Yeah. Uh, before Thank we you. go though, uh, your next set of books or the books you've written, tell everybody listening why they should get those to read. Yeah, like I was mentioning, they're going to be a lot of fun on the sci-fi side. So if you've been like, damn, I love Justin's writing, but he won't focus on just sci-fi or fantasy. Pick one. Pick a lane, damn it. Uh, <laughs> I have chosen my lane for these next few books. They're going to be awesome. Uh, they're very fun, and they're all standalone, actually. So if you want to get – there's three of them that will be coming up, and they're each standalone in their own universe. There's no, like – spinoffs and all this stuff and so i know some of my readers have been confused because i do huge universes with all the books kind of intermingling you know like how marvel does and i'm taking a break from that i'm just doing a book a book a book so if you want to get into some fun sci-fi read the book and be done now's your chance if you don't want that you can go read all my old stuff <laughs> great got it justin i appreciate you getting back on and we'll get these episodes up and then people can hear all the great conversation we already had about video games and awesome thank you so much Thanks, Thank Justin. you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.